Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Eva Schachtman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the co-op council president. Thank you for joining us this year. It's great meeting in person and providing a hybrid option for those who would prefer to attend remotely. As you're all aware, there's been a lot of turmoil on the personnel front, including the harassment of a minor age employee. Later in the meeting, we will share more about this and the steps that have been taken since. We'll also be asking you to share your ideas on what our community needs so that we can heal. Your patience and understanding during this period of uncertainty is greatly appreciated. We will also be giving members an opportunity to respond to the question, how can we be even more inclusive at the co-op? Responses may also help the council in discussions about revisiting ENDS policies in the coming year. I'll be speaking later in the meeting to share highlights. Until then, let me introduce you to Bill Cavanaugh, a farm business advisor with the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, also known as NOFA VT. He works with farm businesses across all stages of scale and stage of business with a focus on beginning and livestock farmers. Bill also administers NOFA's Farmer Emergency Fund, which provides support for farmers experiencing impact from natural and unnatural disasters. Please welcome Bill Kavanaugh. See if this works. All right, hi everybody. My name is Bill Kavanaugh. I'm a farm business advisor at NOFA Vermont. Um, my job, my day to day at NOFA, is I work with farmers on uh, business strategy, business planning, cash flow analysis, um, some marketing support, um, sort of, you know, day to day on the business side. One of the other things that I administer at NOFA is our farmer emergency fund. Um, our farmer emergency fund is typically a, I'd say, a very sleepy sort of uh, fund that we have that we provide to farmers who experience emergencies like a barn fire or um, you know a big windstorm or something like that. And usually, it's we see three or four applications a year. And this year, for reasons that I'm sure are obvious to you, and we'll talk about, um, our farmer emergency fund was really um, very necessary and very um, a very uh, big support in the Vermont farming community. So, really quickly, I will give you just a brief overview of my organization if you guys aren't familiar. Can I get the next slide, please? Pretty, please. Next slide. So, the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. We are a member driven organization. And our goal is to promote organic practices that builds a food system in Vermont that is economically viable, ecologically sound, and socially just. Closer to my mouth, sorry, sorry, bad habit. Um, NOFA was founded in 1971, so we had our uh, 50th anniversary not too long ago. I wasn't around at the founding, but I was, um, I've been here for four years now. Um, and we're one of the oldest organic farming associations in the United States. Can I get that next slide? Next, take the next one. Sorry. Okay, so NOFA has four um, sort of main focuses of our work. Farmer services, which is the team that I work on. Um, we support the viability of Vermont farms via technical assistance and, and business planning support. We have our food access team, which makes local and organic food findable and affordable for everyone. Some of you might be familiar with our Share the Harvest program um, and a few other food access programs that we run. Um, we run education and community building, so we have um, on-farm workshops, we have our winter conference, and we also do advocacy and policy, so we've been working on that a lot lately, especially around climate change. Next one. Okay, so what happened this summer? There was a lot of rain, 
And so basically starting, really starting on July 9th um, through the 11th, heavy rains fell over the entire state. Uh, we saw six to nine inches over a pretty wide area, pretty much the, the whole state, if you really look at the map there, especially right down the middle in, the, in sort of the spine of the Green Mountains. Um, Winooski and Lamoille both exceeded levels that we saw in Irene, just a, just a massive, massive amount of water um, that got dumped. And it wasn't just flooding for a lot of farms. For a lot of farms, it was the sheer sort of volume of the water that came through, washed out access roads, destroyed infrastructure, um, ruined uh, crops that were in storage, and also in some cases killed livestock. Next one. So then we talk about the summer. So the heavy rains didn't just stop. And this, I came across this little graphic while I was putting this presentation together, and that is the 30-year uh, average rainfall is the sort of straight line there measured at the Barry Airport. And then uh, 2023 is the exponentially rising blue line above it. So that was, um, you know, you can see the rain event on the 9th, 10th, and the 11th, but then it just really kept raining. Um, that was something that we weren't really expecting. We were, you know, thinking in the farming community that we'd have this flood event, we'd deal with it, we'd get past it. Um, but it, just, it didn't work out like that. It, it rained all summer. So what that meant was farmers had a really hard time um, repairing from the flood, repairing damage, replanting. Um, and it also meant there was an incredibly poor hay crop. So for the livestock farmers, dairy farmers in Vermont, um, this summer into the fall, the hay crop was just a fraction of what they would see in a normal year, which is obviously has a huge economic impact because they've got to pay to feed the cows and that feed just wasn't coming off the fields. I'll take the next one. So we pretty much as soon as the rain started, um, we put together, NOFA put together a uh, farmer impact survey. So went out to pretty much all the farmers within our orbit um, and we got 120 responses and the average respondent said that at least 25% of their farm was flooded. So, a little bit of sample bias. I mean, most people who had flooding were more inclined to respond, but it was still a really, really big number, and we were just sort of staggered at the impact. You know, we were we were expecting you know some localized problems, some localized flooding, and it became clear really, really quickly that it just it was a much wider impact than we were sort of thinking we were going to see. A little bit later in the summer, I'm jumping ahead in time here, but later in the summer, the Agency of Agriculture put out their own survey. And what that saw was that they were reporting an average loss. The farmers that responded reported an average loss of 28% of their annual income for the year. Um, biggest loss coming from, from hay for livestock as well as flooded um, crops. And for anybody who doesn't know, doesn't work super closely in the agricultural world, if flood water touches any sort of a harvestable crop, it's gone. It cannot be harvested for human food. It's considered contaminated and has to go. So. The, the timing of the floods could not have possibly been worse. There was a lot of food really ready to harvest. I mean, think about, you know, mid-July, late July, a lot, a lot of stuff ready to be harvested, and it just got, you know, just rotted in the field. So really, really tough to see. Um, and one of the things, and I won't get too wonky on this, but one of the things that, that we saw in our survey and also the Agency of Agriculture saw is that 70% of respondents had no crop or livestock insurance. So we could we could sort of parse out the whole deal with livestock or crop insurance livestock insurance it doesn't really pay out much but for farmers who don't have it it pays out nothing so we were seeing this really really big economic impact with essentially no you know insurance type of remuneration coming so i think the the sort of main impactful number I'll take the next one is the agency of agriculture's survey returned $16 million in total damages and losses to Vermont farms, which in the grand scheme of the world, sometimes that doesn't seem like a massive number, right? I mean, 16 million, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you think about the size of the state that we have, the size of the farms in the state, that was a, that's a huge, huge impact. I mean, this is absolutely on par with what we saw with Irene. Um, and, you know, it, this, is, this is still sort of a, a, a moving number, right? Because this was sort of $16 million as reported end of August, early September, and I think farmers are still just now today seeing impacts on loss of hay, you know, not being able to fully harvest all their crops for the year. So 
that was sort of a, a, a big number that stuck out for us. We were really just kind of blown away by, by how big that loss was. I will take the next one, please. So we wanted to talk a little bit about our response at NOFA Vermont. Um, like I mentioned before, we have a farmer emergency fund. It is typically um, maybe usually about hundred to maybe $200,000 and it. it's just a fund of money that we have available. Um, it's been going since I think 1996 we started doing it. Um, and we knew kind of right away that that was something that we we're going to need to, to tap into for farmers. We also knew that we were going to need to fundraise um, because the loss was just really, really high. So um, we had our first post-flood meeting, um, 8.30 on the morning of the 11th. I think it was still raining. Um, we had the whole, the whole team sort of circled up um, to sort of figure out what exactly our response was going to be and what we could do to help. So um, one of the first things we started doing is we started calling farmers. So we basically called, you know, we, as, as, a, as the Organic Farming Association of Vermont, we have a pretty deep Rolodex of farmers, and we just started making phone calls. Um, I think every single person on staff probably called about 40 or 50 individual folks just to, number one, check and make sure they were okay and they were safe, um, and also just to get a sense of what they needed from us and from the community. So um, what we heard from farmers, so one of the things about this particular event and, and what happened this summer is that every single farm was affected differently. It wasn't just, you know, the floodwaters came, they destroyed some crops and they went away, you know. Um, one of the things that we saw from farmers um, a lot was that, you know, their farm might have been okay, but all their customers got flooded out. You know, one of the, one of the very first farmers I talked to um, very early on in July was a, was a woman um, in the sort of greater Woodstock area. Her farm was totally fine. She was up on a hill, didn't see all that much rain, but 90% of her produce went to wholesale accounts that no longer existed. These restaurants, these stores were completely closed completely underwater. I mean, I'm sure you've seen pictures. The Woodstock farmer's market down there was like totally flooded out for pretty much the rest of the summer. So we were hearing from farmers that, you know, hey, like it might look like we're fine, but you know, we've got all this harvested, highly perishable produce in the cooler, nowhere for it to go. So we also realized there were a lot of immediate concerns about maintaining cash flow. You know, they were like, hey, we don't know what's gonna happen in two, three months, but we know that we need help over the next two, three weeks. You know, we've gotta be able to make payroll, we've gotta be able to, to just breathe a little bit and sort of figure out what's going on. And there was also, and I don't wanna to get too into the weeds on this, but there was a lot of question about what support was coming from the federal government, from the state government. There wasn't, at the time, a very immediate response of saying like, hey, you know, we're gonna have these different programs stood up. There was just a lot of question. Um, and it kind of felt like our organization was sort of out there in front and needed to really do something. Next one, thank you. So, our farm emergency fund, I feel like I'm jumping around a little bit, but bear with me. Um, we have a system by which applications come in for our emergency fund and it's reviewed by a review committee made up of a couple um, folks on staff, so myself and, and a couple other staff members, and then a couple farmers. So we have a few folks sort of on the organization side and a few folks who have that sort of on the ground experience. So again, typically, like I said, three to five applications come in a year, barn fire, someone had a freak windstorm, blew down one of the high tunnels. Um, <laughs> that, that system wasn't gonna really hold up to what we saw as the need coming in. So um, we basically put together a spreadsheet, I won't bore you with the details, but to really rapidly turn through these, these applications. Um, you know, just to, to give you a sense of the scale, so three to five applications a year. I think in, in 2022, we had three. In this year, since July, we've had 180 um, applications come in for our farmer emergency fund. So one of the things that we started doing like crazy is fundraise. So, you know, we have a lot of our, as a, as a nonprofit organization, we have a lot of channels to do that fundraising. Um, we have a really awesome fundraising team. And we just sort of put the call out on social media and said, look, you know, we've, we've got a real crisis up here in Vermont. A lot of folks have lost their houses. You know, there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of various sectors have been really hit, but what we can do is support farmers. So we really put the call out, and I think everybody on the team was sort of blown away by just, um, just how much support we saw. So, and one of, the, one of the reasons I'm talking to you guys tonight is 
um, Hunger Mountain had a donation that they made um, through the, and I'm blanking on the name of the program, I'm very sorry, the, the Roundup at the Register program, the, the Give Change program. Um, and that was, I want to say it was a $2,000 totally raise. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but yeah, thank you guys so much for that. <laughs> yeah, very, very awesome. And I think for myself personally, not being someone who works on that side of things, I'm usually more farmer facing, more administrative on this stuff. Um, I was really just really blown away by, by the, just the support we saw from the community, from individuals, from organizations like Hunger Mountain. Um, it was just incredible. It really, it felt, felt good for me and I know it felt good for the farmers because we, you know, we got that feedback from them because we were able to get them that money. So, can I get the next slide? Okay, so just really quickly on the Farmer Emergency Fund eligibility. Farmers can apply for up to $5,000 to cover um, damages. Does not need to be repaid. It's not a, a loan of any sort. It's just a, it's just a grant that we give them. Um, they need to be a commercial farm. They need to be certified organic through Vermont Organic Farmers, which is our NOFA Vermont's um, certification arm, or they need to be a NOFA Vermont member. So, you know, one's a bit of a higher barrier to entry, um, one is a pretty low barrier to entry. Um, in a response to the disaster, we had originally a requirement that farmers would need to be a member for a full year before they could access funds, and we made that day of. So what farmers could do they could join NOFA Vermont for as little as a dollar um, and apply immediately to access funds. So try to make it really, really streamlined. Um, we really, our goal was to, to not sit on these. We wanted to turn them around pretty quickly. I get that next one. So to date, we have raised $1.5 million um, with more still coming in. I think, uh, I don't know what the exact number is today, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, and again, this is a fund that typically had 100, maybe $200,000 in it um, <laughs> up, you know, before July. So just absolutely an incredible, incredible outpouring. Um, and we've awarded, that's actually, since I, since I wrote this about a week ago, um, that said we awarded 165 grants. We are actually at, let me tell you, as of today, 180 grants have gone out um, for a total of $853,362. So, um, again, that's, that's not our money, that's, you know, you know, work of people like you and donations that we've gotten from, from folks in the community who really, really care. So, um, and our average turnaround time, I'm particularly kind of proud of this because this is sort of where, I, <laughs> where I've sort of interfaced. Um, average turnaround time from application to the farmers getting a check, or I guess I should say a check getting in the mail because, you know, that can take a little while, um, eight days. So. You know, it's not a ton of money, $5,000, not a massive, massive amount of money, um, but it is something. It is, you know, it's cash flow help. It's a little bit of support for farmers to sort of, you know, have a little bit of breathing room, figure out what the next steps are, and then possibly access, um, you know, additional funding sources. So um, our goal was to just get that out really, really quickly and, you know, get that, get that to folks who need it. Take the next one. Cool, so this is a quote we got from a farmer. So they said, we are so grateful to have NOFA Vermont supporting us and all the other small organic growers in Vermont. It really does make resiliency in the face of climate change seem possible. I just really like that quote. You know, it's, it's we feel good because we're able to sort of support farmers. You know, again, it's not us doing it. This is just us administering the money that's been trusted to us to give to farmers. Um, but, you know, that's just, it's good to sort of, you know, get that get that feedback to so know that people are feeling supported, if nothing else. Next one. So when I, when I first put this slideshow together, I sent it to a couple of colleagues just to give me some feedback, and I had like six slides of photos, and I just got a note that said, too sad. So um, we're gonna do, we're gonna do just a, two slides, um, just to give you a sense of some of the variation in, in, in the disaster we were seeing, you know. There's some, there's some flooded fields, that, that makes sense, right? Um, you saw that cow there in the last slide, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a cow lane, a laneway at a, at a dairy. You know, they're not, that's not ruined product, that's not flooded crops necessarily, but that is an important piece of infrastructure that was lost because of the rain. Um, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, I think that's strawberries underwater there, someone's washed pack totally, just completely inundated. So, 
you know, just to, just to give you a sense, I'm sure you guys have all seen pictures like this, or you, you know some farmers, or you are a farmer, and you've, you've got your own sort of lived experience in this, but just to, just to give you a sense of, you know, what we were seeing kind of on the, on the day-to-day. So, can I get the next one? Okay, so, what's next? So, this is something I'm kind of really excited about. Um, applications are still coming in for our emergency fund. I processed one today, um, certainly down from, you know, 30 or 40 that we would see in a day, um, end of July into August. Um, but so it's really, it's really slowed down. Another emergency support is available. So the, the Agency of Agriculture has support. Um, some federal assistance has become available. It's not, you know, it feels like it's, there's a little bit more, you know, sort of in motion now. Um, but that leaves us at about $750,000 in the fund. And we don't intend to hang on to that. So we've been really doing a lot of work internally at NOFA to try to figure out you know, now what? We don't, we don't need that much money in the fund, um, and we want to, to really work in the spirit of these donations that we've been given to make sure we get money out to folks and help them as much as possible. So we are planning to open a second round, um, possibly as early as next week. We're going to start sending out information on that um, for farmers who, certainly if they haven't applied at all, they can and should. If you know one or are one, please encourage them to, to apply. Um, but if they have applied and received funding, we're going to go back um, with another $5,000 grant round. So, um, you know, again, in the grand scheme of some of the, the, the magnitude of loss that we've seen, $5,000, $10,000 is not a massive, massive amount of money. But, you know, we do know that it, every little bit helps and the ability to kind of link up, you know, our funds, some state funds, some federal funds, all kind of work together to, to make people whole. So. Um, that's what's next. That's what you know. You guys have have really generously donated to us. That's what that money is, is going to be used for. It's not just going to sit in the bank. Um, certainly, we will keep some for you know there will be a next time. Um, but we are very much hoping to kind of get that out um, to folks really really soon. Can I get the next one? So, and then beyond that, looking forward, I mean you know this was a climate change related event, right? This sort of thing is going to happen. It's going to keep happening. So. Um, just to kind of give you broad strokes of what we're working on internally, you know, we are, NOFA is really interested in building resilience. We really want to make sure that farmers are supported in finding ways to make their farms more resilient to, to everything, to climate change, be more resilient within their community. You know, we're really, we want to focus on that, you know, because these things will keep happening, and the more that we can do afterwards prepares us for the next time. So. Um, NOFA also has uh, what we call our Resilience Grants, which is another um, grant program that we run, typically opens up in the spring, and that's for farmers to sort of apply, define resilience however they define it. You know, it, every farm is different, every farm thinks about things differently. Um, you know, it could be a generator for a backup for their walk-in cooler, or it could be a community meeting space on their farm to help um, build social resilience within their community. You know, we don't, we don't prescribe that. Um, we're just sort of there to sort of help support. And we're also doing a lot of advocacy. So we're really trying to sort of, as much as possible, you know, push forward good climate smart goals, working um, at the state house, working at the federal level, um, just to sort of make sure these stories are told and make sure people understand that, you know, agriculture in Vermont is key to, key to feeding us. It's key to what Vermont is as a state. And the more things like this keep happening, the more we have summers like this, the, the harder it is, and the, you know, the more that sort of impacts all of us. So, um, yeah, that is, our, that is our next little bit. Do I have another slide? No? Perfect, yep, yeah, so, thank you. Um, happy to answer any questions. I'd love to, if anybody has any questions specifically about the emergency fund, some of the work that we're doing, happy to, happy to answer. You don't have to, though. All right. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. So the question was, do we work with the with VI, VYCC, who's sort of our, our neighbor organization in Richmond? Um, we do. I don't personally, so I couldn't necessarily speak to that work. I know that we've you know done some volunteering over there. 
Um, and we've also done, we have a couple like growing projects going on over there, but I, I, don't, I couldn't speak too much more about that. But happy to connect you with someone at NOFA if you have like specific questions about that. I could give him the microphone so you could hear, yeah, yep, good idea. I'm wondering about the fields that were flooded and contaminated. Obviously, we lost the crops for this year, but now I'm starting to think about the next couple years and sort of the definition of organic farming, whether those fields can be considered organic and how, or how soon can they be, or what do, what do you do? Yeah, so that's a really, really good question. Um, I don't want to speak too much to the certification side of things. My colleagues handle that, and I put my foot in my mouth every time I, I talk about certification. What I will say is that was a question that came up a lot with my conversations with the farmers, and we did a lot of testing. We helped a lot of farmers do a lot of testing, not just for the usual stuff um, that you would expect. We did a lot of like E. coli testing and stuff like that. They also tested for heavy metals. So my understanding is that I, I don't know of a farm who saw any like massive long-standing contamination, but it is a really good question. I think that's something that we're kind of all have our eyes on, thinking about how do we, how do we keep an eye on that as it, as it happens? Because that, that is a good question. I don't know if my microphone's gonna reach that far. You might have to, you might have to just yell, just yell. Yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. So um, what, the, what the question was, or the statement sort of was, you know, the most, the most fertile land that we have is along rivers, right? It's in floodplains. It's where the, over eons, it's flooded and deposited all those nutrients and stuff like that. And I think that is something that people are thinking about. I was just out at the Intervale a couple weeks ago touring some of the farms down there. You guys are probably familiar. The Intervale is very, very low, wicked fertile, beautiful, beautiful farmland, um, and just gets nailed when it floods. And it was really interesting seeing some of the farms down there. We toured through some of the infrastructure, and they were actually showing us where, you know, you'd go to a, a wash pack shed, and the compressor for the cooler, which nine times out of 10 sits on the ground, they've got up 10 feet. Everything, they've, they're, they're prepared in there for a 200-year, 300, 500-year flood. Everything is at, I, I, I want to say it's like a 10-foot level. It's all like eye level or above, I'm not 10 feet tall, but you know what I mean, it's, it's a, eye, eye level or above, let's say. Um, because the idea being, it's just, it is just gonna keep happening. That infrastructure has to be located there and all, they, all you can do is adapt. And I think that is a really interesting thing to think about when we think about climate change and we think about this sort of thing that's keep happening, how do we adapt and still maintain our, our farming? You know, we, it, would, it would be a loss, I think, to, to move out of areas like the Intervale or some of the lower lying areas in Montpelier, um, both Culturally, we lose that farming tradition, and also, you know, just economically, that's really good farmland. So that's where we think about sort of adaptation, mitigation versus some other word I can't think of. Other questions? Okay. Well, um, happy to, I'll be kind of around for a little bit. Happy to chat. Um, I'm Bill at nofavt.org if you guys have any follow up questions, shoot me an email or something like that. I'm always happy to talk. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, members of the co-op, welcome. Staff and council, welcome. My name is Nathan Souter and I use he, him pronouns. I live here in Montpelier and have been a member for about 10 years. I've been a consultant and a facilitator for seven years, and I'm here today to support the members, staff, and council as we work together to hold a positive, constructive annual meeting and celebrate the co-op. Because this is a meeting for business with a tight agenda, we provided cards on each table. There are uh, index cards that look like index cards <coughs> on each table. Uh, as questions or comments come to mind, please write them down and put them in the box right here or hand them to a staff person 
to make sure that they're included in the questions and comments that come out of this meeting. During the question and comment period later in the meeting, I've been charged with drawing questions or comments randomly from this box and reading them out loud. We have about a 10 minute period to do that later in the meeting. So we're trying to be equitable in terms of whose thoughts get expressed live in person in the meeting. And then uh, all questions will be addressed to the best of the ability of the staff and leadership later on. And those will be in a blog, in a blog post and distributed via email to the membership. So we're, we're trying to create a feedback cycle where you hear back in responses to your questions or comments. Uh, staff, I just said that. Um, I have a little bit of housekeeping I want to do. Uh, the first we, I, we did with Bill just a little bit, which is anyone tonight who has a speaking role, this microphone doesn't work very well out here. It works much better when it's right here. So you have to pretend you're about to consume the microphone like it's chocolate cake, and then it works really well. Um, bathrooms are to my left at the back. It, to your, most of you are facing me, so to your right. Exit there, exit there. Uh, what else have I got? Um, I think that's my housekeeping list. Uh, at the back of the room, helping us with projection and magnifying my voice is Orca Media. Orca Media, uh, thank you for being here. They're a community resource making this an accessible event. I want to remind everybody here in the room that we have a load of members who are participating via Zoom online. So welcome to folks who are on Zoom. And then uh, there are also maybe members of the public or members in general who are watching this on the uh, public access streaming on channel 1075 on Comcast. Is that accurate, Christopher? OK, fantastic. Uh, so that's that's a way that we're able to include a lot more people in this meeting and also for folks who have health concerns or anything like that that can access the meeting. Um, let's see, next I want to take a quick break. I want you to look, I want you to greet the person next to you and I'll talk about the Zoom folks in just a second. I want you to stand up, shake the hand of the person next to you, say something positive like, hey, you're all right. Uh, those of you who are on the Brady Bunch, that's the Zoom, I want you all to pretend you can see the person in the next rectangle, and I want you to stand up wherever you are in your living room or bedroom, and I want you to say to the space next to you, hey, you're all right. All right, let's do it. Everybody up. Okay, okay, let's not let this get out of hand. Come on back, have a seat. Okay, thank you for indulging me. We'll have a little bit more movement break later in the meeting. Next up, I want to introduce the Co-op Council. We are joined by the Co-op Council this evening. The council is the voice of and responsive to the membership. As such, the council is responsible for setting policy, hiring, firing, and supervising the general manager. The council is not responsible for operations. The council is not responsible for human resources. The council delegates operations, personnel matters, etc., to the general manager. The general manager, interim general manager, is here with us tonight, Mary. General manager is responsible for operations, human resources, marketing, budgeting, financial management, and many other core roles. Council members who are here in the room, please stand when I call your name. Eva Schechtman, president. Thank you, Eva. Um, Jeff, uh, no, Jeff is not in the room. Um, excuse me. Steve, Steve Farnham. There you go, right here. Stay standing. Do me, help, help me with that. Um, and then I think, is that, I think that's it for folks who are in the room. Um, Jen Poirier is here via Zoom. Thank you for attending, Jen. Jeff Roberts is attending via Zoom. Just a quick note, the only two council members who have speaking roles this evening are Eva and Jeff. Uh, Genevieve Cambron is the staff representative joining us via Zoom. 
Lauren Antler, I believe, is here via Zoom. Is that true? Okay. Uh, Liv Dunton, Catherine Lothar, and Ashley Muscarella. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, next, now on to conduct agreements. In preparation for this meeting, in, re in response to the tone and content of interactions regarding the co-op in the last several months, we have written conduct agreements to ensure that all dialogue at this meeting and regarding the co-op in general is marked by civility and the dignity of everyone involved. Our goal is a productive, positive meeting. We are all one community. Everyone in this community de deserves respect and civility. And then one reminder is that we can have disagreements, we can ask tough questions, and we can have difficult conversations that are all marked by civility towards one another. We want members, all of us, we want staff, we want council members to continue coming back and serving the council and serving our community. And one way that we ensure that is by treating each other well. Everyone in the room and on Zoom has consented to these agreements and we are looking forward to a civil and respectful conversation. Thank you. You can read those on the screen. Uh, if you're on Zoom, that's on your screen. Uh, so next up, I want to introduce Rowan Sherwood, who is Community Relations Assistant Manager, to present tonight's agenda. Rowan. Hi, everyone. Again, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here. It is great to finally be together again after the long pandemic hiatus, so thank you for showing up. Um, our agenda tonight is here. It's uh, pretty straightforward. A few things to note. Um, we're obviously welcoming everybody now. Um, we'll go, we'll do an employee recognition. We will present um, the Hunger Mountain Commu Cooperative Community Award and hear about the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund grantees. Um, we'll then establish quorum and have a vote to approve last year's minutes. That's our only official item of business tonight. Um, those red, uh, those yes, no cards that you received while you were coming in, you can use those for that vote. Um, Uh-oh, I need to see the agenda. <laughs> I don't have it. Um, thank you. Um, after that, we'll uh, introduce uh, our candidates running for council. Um, you'll hear from them and we'll uh, describe how voting will work. Um, then we'll uh, hear reports from the council and our general manager, uh, and we'll take some questions and comments. Um, I think Nathan mentioned this, but you know, as questions come up, um, Please write them down on your cards and we'll get them into the box. Given that we have such a limited amount of time, we really want to make sure that all questions can be heard. They might not be heard here tonight. So all of your, we'll get to as many as we can and then we will respond and share out, uh, share out those responses in the coming weeks. Um, so you can lo look for those. Um, we, we will break into small group discussions You'll notice on your tables, some of them have a little tent that say Jedi, and some have a tent that say healing. Um, so when that time comes around, um, the t you know, if you're not at a table that is labeled with the discussion you would like to have, please, you will, we'll invite you to move to that table. Um, we will have facilitators explaining um, how each group will work and you all can have your discussions and take notes and again, get them back to us and we will, we will uh, take that in and, and report back next, any next steps that come out of that. Um, and then we will close with raffles. Um, everyone who is here, uh, both in the room and on Zoom was automatically registered for our raffle prizes. Um, and we will announce the winners. You don't need to be here to win. I mean, yeah, you will still get your prize because we've already drawn the raffles by random number generator. And, uh, but if you are here, you get to take it with you. Um, so can we have the next slide? 
just uh, want to give a thank you. So there's a full list of raffles on your table, but we want to acknowledge uh, Lisa Maze, Singing Spindle, Spinnery, Emerge with Amy LePage, Ashley Arnold and Vermont Natural Resources Council for generous donations of raffle items. Um, and again, we want to thank Orca Media and Joe's Kitchen for that fabulous dinner. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, the artists that we're talking about, so when we get to employee recognition, there are some long-term employees that we are recognizing, and they receive these beautiful uh, plates from Pizzazz Pottery, and then the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award, uh, Matt C. Schultz makes us these beautiful glass apples, so we thank them very much for contributing those things. Yeah. Yay for our artists. Yes. Yeah. All right. And back to Nathan. Right. Um, I'm going to introduce Mary Malali, interim general manager. Mary is going to recognize long-term employees and um, present the employee service award. Come on up. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciated it. Um, so, yes, tonight we're going to talk about milestone, um, milestones for different, aha, uh -huh, milestone anniversaries for, for our employees. But first, I would like to take this opportunity to not only acknowledge these coworkers and their incredible longevity, but the staff as a whole. We have been through a challenging year, and I want to appreciate all of our staff for their dedication and commitment to support the co-op. Absolutely. I am deeply grateful to each and every one of them. As you will see a little bit later, we enjoy a lot of employee longevity at the co-op, and this year these staff members have hit important milestones. And as Rowan just mentioned, for those who reach the 20-year mark, they will receive a commemorative plate made by Pizzazz Pottery. So this year, um, employees who have been with us for 10 years, Doug Barg, Justin Cote, Kurt Jensen, Kevin O'Donnell, Jared Langevin, Dan Needleman, James Sharp, Jan Tobias, and Kate Zariello. Thank you to them. 15 years, Terry Barber, Annie Coughlin, and Juliana Westcott. 20 years, so these are the folks that will get the commemorative plate. Oh, back, yep, thanks. <laughs> Um, so 20 years, William Fox, Tom Goulet, Beth Johns, Robin Joy Pierce, Yuri Prince, J.L. Polskamp, James Rosebush, and Tim Wingate. And then lastly, 25 years, Patrick Luce. Woo! Thank you to all of our staff for their commitment. Okay, so on to the Customer Service Award. This year, um, that goes to Tyson Meyer. And yes, Tyson! So each year our staff nominate and then vote for a coworker who they believe exemplifies internal and external customer service. This year, our Customer Service Award goes to Tyson. Um, he has worked at the co-op for seven years. He's, he is originally from St. Louis, loves seeing live music, and enjoys local and organic foods. That is one of the reasons that he enjoys working at the co-op, actually. Um, in recognition of Tyson's excellent customer service, we are providing with him with a gift certificate to Bent Nails to see some live local music. Congratulations, Tyson, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, next, I want to present Tim Wingate, who is the CFO and finance manager at the co-op. Tim will present this year's Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award. Tim has had the privilege to work with and know this year's recipient for almost 30 years. Tim.
Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to celebrate and recognize one of our most valued and respected members and co-workers, Mary Wells. Mary has been with Hunger Mountain Co-op for over 30 years, and as the bookkeeper and has been a pillar of our cooperative and our community. Mary is incredibly diligent. After an entire year and a retirement of just two days from the state of Vermont, Mary joined our team in the fall of 1990, and today we're celebrating her 33 years at the co-op. Since she joined us, she has worked steadily as our bookkeeper, weekly entering hundreds of vendor invoices, matching up invoices with payments, reconciling monthly statements, researching vendor inquiries, and ensuring that the vendors get paid. She rarely misses a day, and if it's Tuesday at 8.30, you can find Mary at the AP desk, sharing her expertise and wisdom. Outside the co-op, Mary has lived and volunteered in central Vermont for many years, serving as treasurer of the Riverton Snow Dusters Snowmobile Club and the Berlin Historical Society. She organized and held town meeting days, was a 4-H leader, and continues to be active in her church. She enjoys spending time with her family, who's here tonight, and is the mother of five, the grandmother of 13, and the great-grandmother of 22. <laughs> Mary enjoys the Vermont outdoors and is always willing to help and give the helping hand. She even still plows her own driveway. So if you need a plow driver. <laughs> she was an early adopter of green technology and is one of the first people we know to install solar and drive a hybrid vehicle. Mary, we are so grateful for your service, dedication, and friendship. You have made a lasting impact on our cooperative and our community, and you have left a legacy that we will always cherish. It is my pleasure and honor to present you with the 2023 Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award. You Thank deserve you. it. Fantastic. Congratulations, Mary. Thank you, Tim. Next up, Jeff Roberts. Jeff is joining us via Zoom. Jeff uh, will present the recipients of the Hunger Mountain Co-op Community Fund Grants. Jeff is a council member and the current treasurer. Jeff, uh, you're up. And I know that uh, back behind the curtain here, Jess is working hard to work on, to uh, manage the technical pieces of this. So thank you to Jess, even though you can't see her right now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Roberts, and I have the pleasure of, of telling you all about the various uh, organizations that the co-op is supporting this year through its uh, Cooperative Community Fund. Uh, we always get a number of, of uh, applications, and it's always a challenge as to how we allocate the money. That money, by the way, is in part what the co-op does in, its, in the community. So we have a number of these that I want to just touch base on. The first one, Central Vermont Council on Aging, located over in Barry. This will support a project that they're doing for volunteer gardeners and older adults to grow produce and to, and to participate in gardening. The funds will cover part of the soil prep, seeds and other tools uh, in partnership with a local farm. The second one is the Circle Organization, also located in Barrie. And this is, again, a food-related one uh, the, to help them purchase uh, canning supplies and so forth for the communal kitchen. Uh, they are a domestic violence support organization uh, who want to provide a safe cooking for their shelter uh, space and also to support their various residents. They're going to be using this to purchase additional, additional equipment for 
the kitchen, uh, food processor, Tupperware, and so forth. Number three, down in Northfield, is the Glynis Hill Farm. They are doing a, a solidarity CSA program, which offers no cost produce to uh, shares to low income neighbors. The funds will help as a starter and also provide $25 a week for 10 weeks to four families over the winter. A really important uh, benefit which Glynis does in order to help their community. Number three is here in Montpelier, Ishtar Collective. This is the help with paying for the flood damage this past summer uh, to their food storage access. They are a sex worker rights and anti-trafficking organization. Um, their fridge and garden area is actually open to everyone in need. And during the flood, the sad thing is that the refrigerator floated away in the flood waters um, and then damage to the storage area. This is going to help support repairs and new equipment, begin a irrigation system. Uh, we have two additional, uh, well, we have one more additional one and then two applications that we help support in a different way. Uh, the Migrant Justice Center located over in Burlington, it's a statewide organization to partially fund, or fund their request towards a new public address system and computers to further their work fighting for economic justice and human rights for Margaret farm workers here in Vermont. Uh, we also then provided two additional organizations with gift cards use, usable here at the co-op to buy food and other supplies for their two groups. We're really thrilled about how we're able to reach out into the community and support organizations both directly, let's say, creating food uh, here for us or how they support the various civil rights of, of people that we are very, very deeply concerned with. I thank you for your attention and let's keep up the great work going forward. Good night. All right, thank you to Jeff. Uh, next up, we are going to establish quorum. So quorum for an annual meeting of the Hunger Mountain Co-op is 100 members. Getting a little bit of buzz there. If I step away from the speaker, no one gets hurt. Look at that. Okay, uh, so we have 79 members attending via Zoom and 121 bodies in the room. So we're well north of 100 people. That establishes quorum. Uh, made up of online and in-room membership sufficient to conduct the business of the Hunger Mountain Co-op annual meeting. Next up, we are going to vote on the minutes from 2022, but before that, we're going to practice. You all have one of these. It says yes and no. It's a great relationship communicating tool. Consent is important, all those things. Now, folks in the Brady Bunch online on Zoom, you didn't get this special card, I'm sorry, uh, but you do have a reactions uh, icon in the lower part of your screen if you're on a laptop. Uh, and that is how you're gonna vote. You're gonna use reactions and you're gonna raise your virtual hand. So before we do something that matters for the business of the meeting, we're gonna practice. Uh, one of the things that I, makes me feel good about myself is that I, I think of myself as a lifelong learner. And uh, I used to think that a goat was an animal. But I've learned from my kids that GOAT is actually an acronym that means greatest of all time. So we're just going to do a quick impromptu poll. People on Zoom, you're going to raise your virtual hand in response to the poll. People in the room, you're going to, if you're voting yes, you're going to raise the yes ticket. So the query is, who is the greatest of all time between Beyonce, Taylor Swift, or Nina Simone? I'll repeat that in case that didn't sink in. Greatest of all time, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, or Nina Simone? There is a correct answer, just so you know. <laughs> okay, uh, r those of you in the room, raise your ticket if you think Beyonce is the greatest of all time. Oh, boy, the beehive is hurting. 
Uh, online, how are we doing? We got some virtual hands? We're practicing? Okay. All right, that's it's a rough day for Beyonce, even online. Okay, put down your virtual hands online. Next up, Taylor Swift votes. How many Swifties? Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay, at least along, online we got a little bit more support for Taylor Swift. All right, back it off. Last but not least, in my opinion, Nina Simone. Whoo! It's a landslide here in the room, folks. And online, yeah, it's uh, what's the vote count there? <laughs> um, uh, you may have heard the phrase "break the internet." I think that's what just happened to our Zoom. Okay, thank you. Hands down. Good job practicing. That was fantastic. All right. Now I have to get back to my script, which is a little bit drier. Okay. Uh, the way this works is because this is a member meeting. If uh, I need a motion to approve the annual meeting minutes, I have a motion in the back. What's your name back there? Paul Olson moves to pass the annual meeting minutes from 2022. I need a second. I have a second from Steve Farnham. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion about whether or not we should approve the meeting, meeting minutes from 2022? Okay, that's the sound of crickets. Uh, all those in favor of passing the annual meeting minutes or approving them from 2022, please raise your voting tags. Um, I can count the, the people who aren't raising them much more easily than those who are. We've got a, a clear majority in the room, and I see floods and floods of hands online. I'm just going to glance behind the magic curtain over here. Okay, at least 29 online. The rest of them are still finding the finding the reactions tab. So um, we have uh, we have a majority of the members attending, approving the minutes from 2022. The motion passes. Thank you very much. That was the main piece of business of this meeting. Not so bad. OK, next up. This is another movement break. You ready? I thought this might take longer, so I was giving you more space between movement breaks. Um, everybody in the room, I want you to stand up. Come on. Uh, I'm going to have you do one full lap of your table and then sit back down. If you want to add some style, you can try to strut like Mick Jagger or something else. Do a lap, get back to your seat. If you're at home and you're on the couch, you need to get up from the couch. If you're at the kitchen table, get up from the kitchen table. Just take a quick little lap around your kitchen and then come on back and get your face in front of the screen so we can see you on Zoom. Now, normally, I would have some background music, and it'd be like you know, musical chairs, and we cut off the music and would take away your chairs, but I wasn't that organized tonight. OK, well done. Next item of business. Uh, we are entering into the election period for new council members, and Rowan Sherwood superstar from earlier in the meeting, is going to talk about council elections. Rowan, come on up. Hi again. Um, so each year, we as members elect our council representatives. The council is our governing body, and council members are our voice at the co-op. They oversee the general manager and set policies that guide how the co-op operates. They each bring their own expertise and areas of interest to the table, and they are there to listen to your ideas and concerns. This year, we have six candidates for four open seats. We're gonna see some short videos from each of the candidates who have submitted one, and you can learn more about each candidate at our voting website, which is not our regular website. You can get there from our regular website, but to actually vote, you need to go to hungermountaincoopvotes.com. Um, there will also be printed ballots in the exit way of the store, as well as printed materials describing the candidates. So let's see who's running. Our wizards behind the curtain are working on it. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm Christian Connolly, a member owner for about a decade. You and I may not know each other, but you and I already share that together we own our co-op. Today we might also share valid feelings of anger, dismay, and distrust toward our council and management. Our council defers to management without blinking, and both groups ignore or deceive us without reservation. It's time for that to end. Let's be the co-op of truth, transparency, and trust. Please join me by voting for change. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carl Etnayer. In difficult times, a co-op needs leaders who know how to disagree without being disagreeable, how to listen to people who've been hurt and take their concerns seriously, and how to respond to all types of inputs from members. As a result of my work on the council from 2016 to 2018, and then subsequently chairing the committee that revised the bylaws, members now have more tools to participate in co-op democracy. Please help me continue that work. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephen Farnham, and I'm looking to be re-elected to the Governing Council of the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op. We've been through a lot this summer, and it is my hope that I'll be able to participate in the council going forward and closely examine how we could have better handled what happened this summer and how we can better handle it in the future. My contact information is on the website, and it's also posted at the exit of the co-op. Please let me know if there's any way I can be helpful. Thank you again for your support. Hi, I'm Catherine Lothar. I joined the co-op in 1989. My background includes growing food organically all my life, being in private practice, doing psychotherapy and health counseling, and teaching at Goddard College for 23 years, where I started the BA in sustainability program, offered courses in climate change, and helped the college reach carbon neutrality. I'm very grateful to be on the co-op council, where I chair the sustainability committee, and help the co-op localize our food sources, support our farmers, and reduce carbon emissions. In terms of the co-op and what is happening now, with at least some elements within the member owner community wanting to intervene and change certain aspects of how things are managed and governed, and meeting with a wall of resistance and resentment from the existing council and management, it seems clear to me that we are in a learning moment. The membership needs to be heard and the council needs to listen. If we do not learn, then we will fail to come together and we will be a divided house and miss the blessing of being the best that we can be. I'm hoping for the best. So, uh, ooh, I feel like I'm not, ah, there we are. Uh, okay, so uh, voting actually began at 5 p.m. tonight and will remain open until 8 p.m. on November 27th. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have four open seats and six candidates. You have now heard from them directly. Feel free to go to the voting website. Again, it's hungermountaincoopvotes.com, and you can read their full bios and cast your vote. Um, and again, all the information is in the exit way of the store in paper form for those who prefer that to the computer. Um, with that, I would like to thank uh, our outgoing council candidates, I mean, the council members. Um, well, I guess instead of doing that, we will, oh, okay, we're good. We can go to the next one. This, okay, thank you. So our outgoing council members uh, are RJ Adler, Liv Dunton, and Julia Shire, and Gen Genevieve Cambron is our staff representative. They are all finishing their terms or leaving the council, and we want to just thank them for their service. So thank you all. All right. I just want to pause. Uh, is it, I got one report from the floor that we heard from five candidates via video, not six? Yes, we, uh, there is one candidate that d had not yet submitted a video. Um, we're hoping to be able to receive that soon and get it up on the, on the website so people can get to know them as well. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Paul, for bringing that up. Uh, it's, uh, it's Elizabeth Jesdale, who is also a co-op employee. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, next up I want to introduce again Eva Schechtman, who is president of the council, and then following Eva will be Mary Malali, interim general manager. Interim general manager. Uh, Eva is going to present the council report, and then Mary will present the management report. Thank you so much. Do you want that one or do you want here? Let's see. 
Do you all mind if I stand behind the podium? Okay, thank you. Um, so, pardon me for just a second here. Okay, yeah, I gotta be right up against the mic. I'd like to start by thanking everyone who contributed to the continued success of the co-op this year. Thank you to all the co-op employees and managers with all the obstacles that have made work challenging this year. To Interim General Manager Mary Mullally for her leadership, and to former General Manager Carrie Bradley for his 19 years of dedicated service to the co-op. Now I'll be sharing some highlights from our previous year in regard to our mission statement and the work that the Council has focused on. Let's begin with the part of our mission that calls for a vibrant community. We ended our fiscal year with just over 10,000 members, which means that one in six people in our community are co-op members. It's really extraordinary. In our annual shopper survey conducted in February, we found that our shoppers are highly likely to recommend the co-op to friends and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your support. Our Co-op Cares program grew significantly in the past year as it has for the past three years. I love this program so much. As engaged members, as you all know, leadership of the Co-op is vital to everyone's experience, staff, member owners, vendors, council members, and the larger community. On the topic of leadership, our focus is on recruiting and hiring a new general manager to lead our Co-op. Equity is the state or quality of being fair. The council has come to recognize that to be equitable, we need to address not only compensation for the work of council and committee members, but also our use of time. As a result, earlier this year, council development focused on participation in agenda planning, committee restructuring, and time management training. As you may know, the council has an annual retreat every year, this year, we focused on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and ENDS policies. Quick side note here on how we as a council work. We set and operate under ENDS policies, and you may ask, what's an ENDS policy? It's a destination we want to reach as a co-op. One example is sustainability. Years ago, the council set sustainability as an end, and then directed the co-op leadership to make this a priority. In this case, one strategy is more reliance on solar power to meet our energy needs. The general manager and their team then report back to us on their progress. As Mary will report in a few minutes, the co-op has made real progress towards sustainability in its energy use in the last three years through solar power. One of the results of the annual retreat was our dinner and discussion panel presentation this past May at the Senior Center. It was our first in-person event since the pandemic began, and it was great to be together again, just like we're here tonight. We heard from farmers and food producers who represent BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and LGBTQIA+, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and questioning, intersex, asexual plus, and had a lively discussion about the issues they face. We also gathered feedback from the presenters and member owners for future council discussion on ENDS policies and for planning future dinner and discussions. A big thanks to everyone who made that event a great success. And now I'm going to invite our Interim General Manager, Mary Mullally, to present her report. Thank you all very much. Hi again. So before I begin my portion, oh, let me get this right. Um, before I begin my portion of the business report, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge the recent structure fire at RK Miles. We are profoundly relieved and deeply thankful that no one was injured in the structure fire at the lumber yard next to the co-op last Wednesday. Immense gratitude goes out to our staff and shoppers for their quick thinking, ensuring a safe evacuation. 
Our hearts are filled with gratitude for the heroic and tireless efforts of the first responders and fire departments who protected our community, including the co-ops building. Our thoughts and support are with RK Miles during this challenging time. While we're still evaluating the damage to the outside of our building, the swift reopening of the co-op would not have been possible without the incredible support of our community. We wholeheartedly appreciate the first responders and firefighters from Washington County. We, we, our sincere thanks extend to Green Mountain Power, Tanner Electric, and New England Air for their prompt response in getting our systems back up and running. We are deeply grateful to Community Harvest of Central Vermont for their offer of support and fast action in picking up perishable products for charitable distribution. Our profound gratitude goes to Consolidated Commu Communications for their dedication to restoring our phone and fiber lines. Finally, a heartfelt thank you to our dedicated staff for their unwavering support in reopening our community's co-op. And to our community, we extend our heartfelt thanks for your outpouring of support. In times of adversity, our co-op has displayed remarkable resilience and unity. And it's in these challenging moments that this true spirit of cooperation shines. Thank you. Transitioning back to our business reports. So part of our mission calls for us to create a sustainable local food system. This effort is supported by our 362 Vermont farmers who we purchased over $9.4 million in goods and services from in the past year. Take that off. Our customers also demonstrated their commitment to supporting the local economy by purchasing over $11 million in local products from us. That is about 40% of our gross sales. In the past year, we began several new partnerships with BIPOC and LGBTQ plus local farmers, and that includes Susu Community Farm in Newfane, Vermont, Milkweed Farm in Westminster, West Vermont, and Bartlett Hill Berry Farm in Plainfield, Vermont. In addition to the co-op's local purchasing activities, which help to improve our environmental impact due to a reduction in miles from farm to table, we have shown a reduction in propane use, combined with that with the offset from our solar array production, and we have again decreased the total amount of CO2 we have emitted this year by 17%. We are also proud to be able to provide over $91,000 in donations and sponsorships this past year. The majority of these funds went to support stabilizing food insecurity in central Vermont, including over $12,000 that went to the Montpelier Food Pantry. A huge part of our vibrant community that the mission refers to is our staff, our coworkers who show up every day and continue to contribute to Hunger Mountain Co-op success. Our team totaled 188 employees at the end of the fiscal year. 74% of our employees are member owners and 83% participate in our retirement plan. We continue to enjoy longevity with our staff, as you saw in an earlier slide with 84 employees working at least five years, 57 employees working at least 10 years, and 15 working at least 20 years. We really value and appreciate their commitment. All right, now shifting to a very brief, I promise, financial report. For fiscal year 2023, which ended July 2nd, we are pleased to share that our fiscal year 2023 financial statements were reviewed by Wegner CPA. Based on their review, no material modifications to our accounting procedures were needed in order for them to be in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the U.S. And also note that the fiscal year 2022 financial statements were audited by Wegner CPA as well, and they expressed, they expressed an unmodified opinion. So our, our mission speaks to thriving cooperative commerce, and one way we measure that is in terms of our own business. Our gross sales were up 6.9% to $29.1 million. We also invest in other co-ops and associated loan funds that support cooperative development as well. We currently have over $671,000 invested there. Additionally, we contribute to other co-ops by selling their products. Last year, about 1.4 million, or close to 5% of our sales, were from product made by other co-ops. 
We, ha we also had net sales of 28.4 million. After accounting for cost of goods, operating expenses, and other adjustments, we had a net income before taxes of $332,000, just over $332,000. The council declared a patronage refund of just over $323,000, which we will distribute 60% of this coming March as a credit at the register. The balance sheet indicates that we are in solid overall financial health with 11.5 million in total assets. This is equal to our total liabilities of 3.55 million and total equity of 7.95 million. This equity is, net, is the net worth that we have accumulated as a cooperative community over our 51 years. And that concludes my portion of the financial report. Um, and before we transition to comments and questions about the report, I would like, a, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge um, the incidents of harassment from this spring. We recognize that these upheavals have caused, um, sorry, we recognize the upheaval these events have caused in our community and understand that they are in direct contrast to our values as a member-owned cooperative business. Our co-op takes concerns of sexual harassment extremely seriously. We have continued to cooperate, cooperate with law enforcement to ensure justice is served. Furthermore, we are committed to fulfilling our pledge to enhance our policies and procedures to create the safest possible environment at the co-op for everyone. It's crucial that we take a moment to share with you the steps that we have taken since July. We have worked collaboratively with, our staff, collaboratively with our staff and union to update the harassment policy, aligning it with the new changes to the Vermont state law that took effect in July. We hired an external HR human resources expert who, during their time with us, reviewed our documents and procedures used in the harassment case, providing recommendations for HR best practices moving forward conducted an audit of our current HR practices and policies, and served as interim HR manager during the transition. I'd also like you to help join me in welcoming our new HR manager. As of Monday, November 6th, we have welcomed a seasoned human resource manager, Dean Valencourt, who was hired through a selection committee composed of both staff and management. Uh, we're currently collaborating with the union leadership and Outright Vermont and Mosaic to provide listening sessions for staff who were affected by harassment concerns. And we're also working on setting up training for union leadership and management led by Outright Vermont and Mosaic. Additionally, we plan for the future development of the all staff training on sexual harassment, utilizing insights gained from the mentioned training. And separately from this, we're planning for a more in-depth training of our management team as well. We understand that this has been a difficult time for everyone. Please be assured that our co-op is fully committed to ensuring a safe, trusted, and valuable work environment and community resource for all. This commitment remains our daily focus at the co-op both today and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Rowan? to discuss the Q&C, questions and comments. Right, so if anyone has um, a question or a comment, you can raise your hand or raise the card and we can have a few people circulating around to collect those. Um, so if you have something that you would like to put into the mix, just raise your hand, raise your, uh, let us know. I see one in the back um, and we'll, we'll gather up what we've got. Um, do we have, what, what do, are we having some questions coming in over Zoom? Okay, so we will also uh, pivot to those in the course of this. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well then. Um, yes. <laughs> I know. I feel like the little kid drawing a raffle ticket. Oh, I got some more coming from the back. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Winston. Okay, so we have allotted about 10 minutes for this. Winston's gonna help keep me honest on the time. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, hopefully you like my voice. Hopefully I can do justice to the uh, tone and content of the questions. Thanks for participating this way. And just wanna reiterate that the co-op is committed to 
responding to questions and comments in time as best they are able, uh, because obviously they're, they, they matter. Your questions and comments matter. Okay. I was disappointed to hear that no candidates spoke of their experience of overseeing a multi-million multi dollar organization that many, uh, hold on, uh, employees and vendors depend on for their livelihood and for that of their families. Thank you. Uh, I am so grateful to Hunger Mountain employees who persevered during the pandemic. Thank you. Winston, you have a clock going for me? You have a timer going for me? Excellent. Oh, my goodness. All right. Um, comment. This is not a question. There is a question later on. There is a question later on. Rather, this is a comment about the nature of the community agreement below. I found it written in a negative way. I ask, what does the behavior at previous meetings tell you about the shadow of the organization? The suggestion that council member members fear for their life is interesting to me. Have council members been able to express their silent collusion, I think, uh, I think they mean collusion, with an administration that has perhaps not handled things in a transparent and accountable manner? A, uh, even though that management has been removed? Just asking. I would be happy to receive a reply from council who have been sitting on the board throughout this period. Why do you believe that you are being targeted? Your lack of knowing about the problems is something you need to take responsibility for. You are not the victim. You participated in a flawed system. How will you change the system to become willing to listen? How will you change the system to create a safe space for people to express their concerns and be heard in a timely fashion? How can you justify throwing money at temporary managers, paying them at a rate that is so disproportionate to the staff salaries? How are the interim managers listening to the membership? Question. My question is, will the co-op board during this time change, I think they mean time of change, continue with the current governance structure or seek to receive education and training to learn about a more inclusive governance structure such as sociocracy? The Franklin Community Co-op has done this. The current governance model has allowed for a top-down structure that may very well have contributed to the problems that were allowed to continue. How open is the board to learning about system changes? Thank you for reading my comment and question. I look forward to your response. How can we get the staff employees to be more engaged with members in an open, positive manner? Good question. Uh, <laughs> what was in the minutes that we all approved? That's a great question. So, <laughs> uh, I can answer that one. Um, there are paper copies of the minutes up front uh, at the registration table. Minutes are available online on the annual meeting page as well. And I did not attend last year's annual meeting, shame on me, but were you there, you could corroborate or uh, disagree with what's contained in the minutes. Is that okay that I answered that question? I'm just a facilitator. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hello. As Hunger Mountain Co-op's new human resources manager, I would like to attend the annual meeting for the betterment of my understanding on the current state of the organization. Thanks. Dean. Dean, as a member, welcome to the annual meeting. I think you're the dean who's here. All right. Why did the co-op fail to address the false narrative in the media regarding accusations of sexual harassment? Okay, I've got six, six minutes down or six remaining? Six minutes remaining. We're going to get through a lot of these. This is great. Hello, the whole thing is going... Hmm. The whole thing is going sound here, and of course, everyone is sharing facts. That's really excellent. Keep writing. Keep up writing. Okay. It is totally inappropriate to have us sign the conduct agreement. According to the bylaws, all members are entitled to attend the meeting. For any change to that, the council would have had to had a warned meeting of the members. Um, for what it's worth, there was there, no member was prevented from being part of this meeting, either on Zoom or in person. And the um, anyway, so. But I take the point. 
I'd like to hear more about how the co-op is improving workplace culture, empowering employees, and improving managerial accountability. My hands are getting full. I'm just gonna have you start handing them to me. Is that okay? All right. This is probably probably good, good for other people to hear the same questions. Why has a current manager not been fired for their inappropriate actions towards another coworker? Please explain why the co-op fought to the death to protect this person and their job, while also committing actions like terminating a worker's job after an anonymous complaint, and no evid evidence or investigation to support the claims being made. What did we get out of our investment in the HR consultant? I consider the conduct agreement to be an illegitimate attempt to take away my free speech rights. Organizers should be open to taking questions from the floor. More questions will arise in our minds as we go through the meeting and hear various ideas and comments. Part A, questions to co-op employees, hourly sal salaried. One, have employees' concerns been addressed regarding managers who were accused of bullying or intimidating behavior? Two, I was given to understand that Kari Bradley was an extremely good businessman, the one who brought the co-op to where it is now. In terms of success, in terms of success, I'm curious, after all the noise that was recently made by members and staff, if employees have been positively affected by his resignation. If so, how? Number three, have employees been positively affected by the resignation of the HR director, Jay Wisner? If so, how? Part B, questions to candidates running for council. Um, Billy Donovan, who withdrew his candidacy, so is no longer a candidate, uh, Billy Donovan harassed the bylaws committee time and again because they voted online in Zoom meetings during the pandemic. He said it was against the rules. He is still angry at those who were on that committee. Questions. A. To be elected today, many will have to vote for him online. Can he accept that? And B. If elected, he too will have to vote online during meetings. Can he do it? I'd like Billy to answer these two questions. Uh, I don't believe Billy is here and probably not available to answer those questions. but. Point taken. Uh, Christian Connolly sent pages and pages of emails to the co-op staff and council because bulk goods were not provided via the curbside program during the pandemic. Will Christian answer the question as to how, if elected, he would work effectively as a council member if, A, he cannot understand the concept of, um, quote, shortage of staff, unquote, and how staff were stretched thin during the pandemic. If he cannot understand how a business must allocate staff hours to where it is needed most, and B, in addition, how he would respond if he were bombarded continuously with numerous long emails. Would it help him do his job? What is the community used to represent, hmm, what is the community used to maybe represent one, Colon six. Ah, great question. Thank you. So in the, in the um, I think in Eva's report from the council, Eva reported that we had, that the, the co-op had 10,000 members, more or less, uh, as of the close of the fiscal year, and Eva reported that that represented one in six members of the community. Is that, I understand. No, I just, I'm, I'm trying to clarify the question. It's based on the population of Washington County. Based on the population of Washington County. Thank you. I love it when we can answer a question right away. Can, one, minute, one minute to go, okay. Can you tell, I will, I'm just gonna speak really quickly. Can you tell us more about what changed in the HR policies? How's the search going for the new general manager? How are employees go doing in terms of morale? What can members do to help? That's a lovely closer. Maybe we'll stop there. That was nice. Let's stop there. Okay. Um, so most of those that you saw printed out on strips of paper came in during the registration process when people registered online and they were able to add comments or questions. So I think that 
in the initial design, the questions and comments period was supposed to be reflecting upon the reports of the council and the management, but obviously there's a lot going on, so I think it's useful to have heard questions that are on other topics. Okay, uh, next up, we are gonna break into groups for small group discussions. Um, the, let's see, there are two topics for the discussions. One is about community healing and what the community may need to heal. That's gonna be led by Rachel Jolly, and those folks will be at tables. Uh, <laughs> right, sort of starting here and going that direction. Uh, the second topic is about justice, equity, inclusion, and diversity, JEDI, uh, and more specifically about inclusion at the co-op and how it's practiced, and that is gonna be led by Ellie Wood, People sitting at tables from, to my right and your left and towards the door are gonna be participating in those discussions. Uh, if you are sitting at a table that is about inclusion and you wanna be talking about community healing, get up and move over to the community healing side and find some friends. If you're in the community healing side of the room and wanna be talking about inclusion, hop up and move over here. Um, Rachel, will you stand up? Rachel Jolly is going to be leading the community healing discussion. Ellie Wood, will you stand up and wave over by the door? Ellie Wood is going to be leaving, leading the inclusion discussion. Uh, give, let's give us 90 seconds to get up and move seats if you want to move seats. Thank you very much. There's still cake. There's still cider. Don't sleep on that. It's all really good. How is it working for the folks on Zoom? So I think what's going to happen is that on Zoom, We've got, there'll be two breakout rooms on Zoom. I'm, I'm going to hand this to Rowan, who knows what's happening on Zoom. So there will be uh, two breakout rooms in Zoom, which people can self-select into those rooms. And uh, each of them will have a shared document in which they can record their notes as well. So we will receive that. Um, and we will have a few staff popping into the Zoom rooms to check in with folks and make sure that they're moving along. So. Let's give it about one more minute to find the right table for you, and then we are going to hand over the floor. And then We won't be using the PA. Oh, wait, maybe we will. Rachel. Rachel is going to take over the microphone. Thanks. Hi, everyone. For the healing groups, I'm going to suggest that even if you are at the right table with the label, if we can move towards this side of the room that would really help for audio purposes since we don't have use of the PA just to provide some space in between the two groups. I hope that's okay in terms of mobility but just asking anybody who's interested in the healing group to move to tables this way. All right I have a motion to adjourn from Stephen. I have a second from Eva. All in favor of adjourning this year's annual meeting raise something. All right, raise your children, raise your hand, raise your yes tag. We have uh, approved a motion to adjourn. Have a great evening, folks. It may be slippery out there. Stay warm, stay safe. Thank you all for coming. Cheers.